Pittsburgh. Well, y'all look good. I mean, the light's in my eyes, but. Worship with us this morning.
Good morning, church. How glad are you that you're here? Oh, amen. Amen. Yes, I have it on such good authority that the Lord's going to be here today. Amen. Amen. That's what it's about. We're also very glad you all are here. And all everybody joining us online, we're thrilled about it. And we just want to, we just want to worship the Lord this morning. We just want to have church and uplift the name of Jesus. That's what it's about. A couple of announcements for you. Uh, we, are, we are in the period of the year I call getting back to normal. It's not been normal all summer because the in and out and vacations and that's all good things. That's all great things. But we are in the getting back to normal stage. I love that every year. I look forward to this time every year. And with that, Awana will be starting very, very soon. Actually, uh, September the 6th is the first Awana, official start of, of Awana with the kids and everything. But before that, uh, the, the 23rd of this month, on a Wednesday, Kyle's having a meeting for past workers and helpers that want to help again this year. That, that, and anybody new that would, is interested in Awana, interested in leading, interested in helping, whatever it might be, we want to encourage you to come on the 23rd of this month uh, as we begin to kick this off. If you've never done Awana, if you're curious, come out and find out what it's about. Uh, it is truly a blessing. What Awana does is we teach young people the Word of God. They learn to quote Scripture in a way that, uh, that they really, really enjoy, okay? And once you start putting the Word of God into these young people, man, that is a foundation the devil can't destroy. So that's what we're doing. That's what we want to be about. So I would look, urge you to, to, to come to that meeting on the 23rd to see what it's about. Pray for Awana this year. Uh, tonight, 5 o'clock, there's prayer meeting in the chapel. At 6 o'clock is our regular service. Have a, have a very special guy going to preach for us tonight, a man by the name of Cliff Rose. Cliff and I have known each other many, many years. Uh, you don't know Cliff, but you know his family. He's very closely related to Miss Kim. <laughs> it's Kim's dad. Yeah, yeah. In case you didn't know it, Kim grew up a preacher's kid. And we are not the worst. <laughs> and then married a preacher. She's all about this preaching stuff. <laughs> So Brother Cliff will be preaching for us tonight. I'm really, really looking forward to that. Now, this morning I have such a treat for you guys. We have, and, I, and I've been here quite a while. I've watched our young people, so many of our young people grow up. I've watched them through their, through their grade school, their middle school, and through their high school years, and I've watched them as they go into college. And what I have seen is... A lot of our young people go to college and get a wonderful education, but tend to drift because college is not all about Jesus and tend to find a bit of a, of a separation. Well, I've got a young man this morning that loved Jesus before he went to college, but loves him more now after the first year of college. And that, I'm just over the top. He's going to share a little bit with you about what brought him to the point he is. Uh, and uh, him and his sister went on a, a, a trip this past summer that, these are his words, was life-changing. So I want you to make Brother Colin Beers welcome this morning. and how to um, uh, just say we accepted Jesus as Lord earlier on, but what does that look like after that? What does our life look like after we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior? And so I'd like to just briefly describe my testimony and how I kind of got to know the Lord. And basically in my testimony, I, I was baptized at eight years old in this church. I've always gone to this church, I've always been a part of it, and I've always loved it. 
But when I was baptized at eight years old, I professed to know something, and it was Ephesians 2.8, where it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, this is a gift of God. And at eight years old, instead of uh, thinking that I was saved because of this, by grace of God, I thought I was saved by baptism. I did not have the understanding of it, because after that I continued to live for myself. I continued to lift myself up in everything I did. I continued to think that just because I was baptized at eight years old, going through junior high and high school, that you know, I was better than others just because I didn't live like others, that I didn't do all the wrong things that others might have done in high school or in junior high or whatever it may be. But instead, I thought I was better than others because, of, because I professed to know Christ and done the right things. And so in high school, I began to get good at a sport called pole vault, which is in track and field, and it really boosted my confidence. I really loved it. I really enjoyed it. And I got to get college offers and go to colleges and see so many different colleges and see what everyone is offering. I ended up committing to a, a college named SEMO in Cape Girardeau, Southeast Missouri State University. And college is stressful. It really is. Going to college, finding out that I can start my life over, that I don't know any of these people in college, that I can be whoever I wanted to be. And so I either had two ways to go. I could either pursue this Christianity that I professed and, you know, actually learn about what I'm professing, or I could go on the complete other path that so many people take. I could live for myself and track. I could have all these friends and that I can party. I can do whatever I wanted. And so going to college, the first couple weeks, I kept getting invited to these events, all these events of slip and slides and um, barbecues, whatever it may be. And I just thought it was all just fun stuff that happened every week in college. They were just great events. And then I met this person named Joey Babbage. And he was just a great dude. He was just so loving, so nice to me. He showed me that how to live a great life and love others. But I thought this dude was in college. Later found out he was 29 years old and had four kids, which <laughs> sounds bad. It sounds bad. But I met with him at lunch one day, and he, he asked me if I was a Christian. I said, totally. I totally believe I'm going to heaven. And he later asked me, he said, what do you think the gospel is? What do you think the gospel is? And I wondered that. I was like, I don't know. I couldn't, couldn't tell him back what my saving faith was. I couldn't tell him what my salvation in Jesus was. And so he professed to what the salvation of Christianity is. That Jesus came and lived the perfect life and died for us on the cross. So that we might be saved even though we don't deserve it. And Jesus conquered sin. And he defeated it by rising on the third day. And so because of Joey sharing this with me, I, I came to know Christ that day. And after that, I started pursuing Bible studies with this ministry. I started pursuing um, going to all these camps that they provided. And then I found out they provided a camp that was nine weeks long, um, which is called Camo Project, which is Campus Movement Project. And I was totally not going to go. I was not about it. Not wasting my nine weeks in the summer where I can go make money, have fun, hang out with my friends. I haven't seen in a while because I was off at college. I was like, no way I'm going. But they finally convinced me after three months of a verse of Galatians 2.20. It says that I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live of the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That my life is no longer my own because of what Jesus did on the cross for me. And so I ended up committing to this nine-week project, and I called my sister that night and was like, hey, I know you're in college. Would you want to go? And she was like, totally. She didn't, she didn't take a second thought to commit with me to this journey. And so now getting into what Camo Project was kind of like, we... Um, Went to Florida on May 28th, and we got 
we got acquainted with all the people. There was around 100 people there from the campuses of SEMO and a school called UIS, which is University of Illinois Springfield. And I'll just run down what a normal day would look like there. They ended up handing us jobs at SeaWorld, so jobs that we didn't even interview for. They just kind of gave it to us because they had a partnership with them, which SeaWorld is not the funnest job, but <laughs> it helps a lot with you know, growing in character, Christ-like character. So we got these jobs, and so we would have a group that we were all being discipled by someone. So I was being discipled by a faithful man named Jack, and it was me and a guy named Owen being discipled by him. And so every morning we'd get up and read a passage together, and we'd create an application for that day or maybe that week that we wanted to pursue, how we wanted to grow in Christ, how we wanted our lives to look more like Christ did when he was on earth. And so we would do that. We'd go to our eight-hour shift to work or whatever it may be. And then we'd normally have a rally at the nighttime that was two to about five hours. We would learn about God through his word. We would sing and praise songs. We would worship God. And then we'd also go share our faith on Thursdays, which was very stressful. Um, sharing your faith is not the the easiest thing to do, and they teach us to be bold in how to share our faith. Because if we truly believe in what Jesus did for us, then we should want to go and tell everybody. And so three, every week had a main point. What are we going to learn about this week? And I'm going to run down three weeks that were the most important to my walk that I learned there. And it was, the first week was who else? That was the main point. Who else? And the, the verse that described that was John 6, 68, that said, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go for you the, eternal life, the words of eternal life? And that basically describes, okay, Jesus died for us on the cross, so who else is there to follow? No one else can guarantee us our salvation like Jesus did on that cross that day. There's no other ways of salvation. We cannot do anything. Jesus had already paid for it. And then that leads into week four, which was lordship. And the verse for that was Luke 9, 23. It said, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What that basically is saying is, okay, now that we've accepted Jesus into our heart, that we should make Jesus Lord of our life. He should be the center of our life. We should go toward his words of eternal life. That is it. Our life should be his. And the last week was very impactful to me, and it was about multiplication. And the verse was Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And it says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So, who else is there? Nobody else can give us salvation. Jesus is Lord of our life. He is the main point of our life because of what he did on the cross. Now, we need to go share the gospel with people. How compassionate we should feel to the lost because they're on a direct path to hell if they don't know Jesus. And so, because of this project, I thoroughly believe me and my sister Allison are thoroughly equipped to live our life for Jesus the way it is intended to be reading through scripture and uh, knowing what God has commanded us, that we can now live our life being faithful to Christ. Even though we don't deserve it, even though it's nothing that we've done and only what Christ has done, that we have eternal life now and that we can rejoice in it. And so now we go and we should share the gospel. And so I thank you that you guys are uh, able to listen to me. And I would encourage you, me and Allison, I know we'd be thoroughly happy to answer any questions if you guys would like, but this project has changed our lives, and we are very thankful for it, and it's all to the glory of God, and so thank you guys very much for listening to me. This is a very wonderful young man. He is a, he goes to school at, at SEMO, as he told you. What he did not tell you, he is one of the premier pole vaulters at SEMO. Yeah, amen, amen.
I keep telling him that's his way to get closer to God, you know, because he keeps going higher and higher. Uh, but that's all good. I am proud of all of our young people. I truly am. But I am so very proud of, of what Colin just shared with you guys. You know, he shared with you what was shared with him, that whole multiplication thing. And he is learning to share it with boldness because it takes boldness, you know. Uh, for those of you who have never stood where he just stood, it can be a little unnerving. Yeah, yeah. And he knows that just how much you all love him. So what do you think it's like when he doesn't know the people he's talking to? But he does it anyway. And isn't that what we're called to do? To tell a lost and dying world about the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for, Lord, for what you put into us. We are so grateful that no matter how old or young we may be, that you have that that you want to instill within us. Lord, you want to ignite that fire. You want to fan that flame that may have been there for many years, but just needs to be stoked a little bit, needs to be rekindled a little bit, needs, to, needs that encouragement. And Lord, we pray that, that today might be that day for someone in this congregation. Lord, if they're here and they don't know you, that today would be the day they'd get saved. If they're here and, and, and they're just grown a little cold and indifferent, Father, that the fires of excitement, the fires of revival might be stoked in their soul. We pray that you lead us this morning. Lord, we pray that you guide us, that you send an anointing upon this stage, that you send an anointing upon this congregation, an anointing upon all those joining us at home this morning. Lord, that you would just literally invade where we're at, that we drive out all the things of the world and allow us to center our hearts and our minds and our entire beings on what you have to teach us this morning, on what you have to say to us, on what you want to show us this morning about just how truly much you love us and how much you want us to love one another and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. When I'm feeling like I've been let down by my friends and my family, I can hear the rain reminding me in the eye of the storm, you remain in control. don't know how I'm gonna make ends meet I did my best now I'm scared to death that we might lose everything 
When a sickness takes my child away And there's nothing I can do My only hope is to trust in you I trust you, Lord In the eye of the storm You remain in control Sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm.
this. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I am free. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I am free. Amen.
Even when my own eyes 
stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your goodness goodness I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your in those last two songs they sang is the fact that you are not alone. And I know in this age we live in, the devil tries to convince people just how alone they are in this world. But you are not alone in the fact that Jesus is right there. You are not alone in the fact that whether you've been here for years or this is your first time, these people are in this with you. The devil will tell you you have nobody. He's a liar. You have somebody. You're here today because you need to know you've got somebody. Amen. All right. Nothing to do with what I'm preaching, but I'm telling you it's everything the Lord wants, to, wants said this morning because I, I see that. I feel that. Scripture reading this morning is Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter. And in this, in this portion we're going to read, Jesus has taken the disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, for you Bible scholars, you know what kind of a place Caesarea Philippi was. For those of you who are not as familiar, Caesarea Philippi was one of the most ungodly places there was in existence at this time in the life of Christ. It was steeped in idolatry. It was steeped in human sacrifice. They were sacrificing children to their god Moloch. Uh, there, is a, there was a place there that they referred to as the gateway to hell. There was eternal fire in it all the time. Uh, it was just a very, very ungodly place. And yet this is the place. This is the place Jesus chose to ask his disciples, Hey, who's everybody say I am? Who does the, what does the world think about me? And they begin to tell him, well, uh, uh, they think you're, you're John the Baptist or maybe Elijah come back or, or, or you're just a great prophet. And then Jesus made it personal because it is personal. Jesus said, well, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? Who am I to you? Which is the question Jesus is asking us this morning. Jesus wants to know, who am I to you? This is Peter's response. This is the 16th chapter of Matthew, beginning in verse number 16. It says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the not upon Peter, but upon Peter's profession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, this account 
is recorded in three of the four Gospels, but only Matthew chooses to include these last couple of verses at what Jesus responded and how Jesus responded to Peter. And he responded telling him that this is the foundation, this is the building spot, this is the building block for the church, okay? All right. You all know what this is. This or something very similar to it was one of the first things you looked at this morning when you got up. I'm not even going to ask how you reacted. And it's also one of the last things you looked at before you left the house. And the problem I have with this thing is whatever it sees, it shows. You know what I'm saying? Good, bad, or otherwise. This is one of the most truthful things I have ever found in life. This thing does not lie as much as I wish it did sometimes. And I prefer this size to the full length ones. I'm just saying, okay? Now, I, I, I'm going to date myself here, but if you were my age, there was a show, and I can't remember the name of it. It was a children's show, and it had a, a mirror like this, but the middle part was gone. Romper, yeah, yeah, you young people, I'm getting ready to tell you something now. Us mature crowd remember romper room. It was called Magic Mirror, wasn't it? That thing freaked me out. <laughs> because this woman would get on, and they're on TV, you know, and I'm watching TV. They're on TV, and she'd get out Magic Mirror, and she'd go, I see Bobby and Billy and Mary. I thought she could see in my house. I mean, she'd start that Magic Mirror stuff, and I would shrink down because I didn't want her to see me. She don't need to be looking at my house. And it did. It freaked me out for a long time, you know. But it was a magic mirror. And, and, and I've seen a few people that had to have magic mirrors to get out the house looking like they looked. <laughs> had to be, you know. But the thing with this mirror, and every mirror, is... This mirror only has one job, to reflect what it sees, right? Like I said, it don't lie. It, it literally reflects what it sees. And no matter, no matter how you think you look, this tells you exactly how you do look, you know? No matter what your mind is telling you, this tells you maybe the same thing Maybe otherwise, if you're willing to listen to it. It's a tool of reflection. And that's the point I want you to remember as I'm sharing with you this morning. Reflection. That's what this, it's his only job. Is to reflect back what's being put in it. To reflect back. So as, as we ponder that point this morning for just a little bit, Jesus founded the church on the statement of Peter, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was the building block for the church. Okay? So the first thing we've got to do is establish the church. What is the church? You've heard me tell you over and over, this Bible you're reading was not written in King James English or, the, or NIV or anything else. The new, most of the New Testament was written in, a, in, in Greek. The Greek word for church, ecclesia. You know what it translates to mean? A people called out. So basically, it has nothing to do with the building. And yet, 
we've made it, our word church, to refer to a building. But as it started out, as it comes through in the Greek, Jesus, what Jesus was saying, I'll build my church upon this rock, this piece of foundational faith, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's not about the building, it's about the people. The, the, the building without the people is nothing. Because you, me, we, we are the church. We say it, we've got to live it, we've got to be a reflection of what it started out to be. It's not about a building, it's not about whether it's got a steeple and a cross on top of it, it's about who's in the building. Any building can be a church because the buildings are not churches. The, build, the church is the people, are the people. We are that church. We're part of the greater church, and we need to, we need to grab hold of it. We need to grasp that. The church is built on the foundation of who Jesus is. Do you know who he is? The last two songs they sang talked about the fact that you're not alone in this world that God wants you to know you are not alone, that he is there for you. He doesn't intend for you to go through this life by yourself. So why are you trying to do it? Why are you trying to fix all the stuff that's wrong? Why are you trying to, to, to hold it all together when you know you can't? Why are you trying to muddle through this and do the best you can when, folks, God's got this if you just give it to him. God can't do anything and, and take control of anything till you let go of it. You, we want to mind... Do you, do, you, do you realize you are trying to micromanage the creator of the world? Let, let it sink in a minute. Let it sink in who you are trying to micromanage. You are his creation. He is not your creation. Thank you. We've got to, we've got to understand this verse. John chapter 3, verse number 30. He must increase, I must decrease. He must increase, I must decrease. I just told you, you're trying to micromanage the creator of the world. And with that thought in mind, let's look at Genesis for just a moment. For just a moment, let's turn back to Genesis. And, and, and I, I love Genesis. I love the book of Genesis. I love the way it starts. In the beginning, God. I could shut it right there because that's all I need to know. In the beginning, God. In the middle, God. In the end, God. In the beginning, God. And then the next word makes it even better. In the beginning, God created. He created. What did he create? Oh, I am so glad you asked. But before we get into what all he created... I want to talk about how long it took him to do it. Now, you study and you read whatever commentator you want to read. And let me tell you how long it took. Six days. We know that, preacher, but what kind of days? Six regular 24-hour days. But, mm -mm. Hear me out. What language was the Old Testament written in? Yeah, that would be Hebrew. All right? The Hebrew word for day is the word yom, Y-O-M. It means day. And, and, I, and I have got a long list that, that I'm not going to, to, uh, to uh, well, I'll just be real honest. I'm not going to bore you with it because I've got enough here to, to, to uh, put you into a deep sleep. Of times this word has been used just in the book of Genesis to represent one 24-hour day. And God even established it. He established it this way in the fifth verse. In the fifth verse of Genesis chapter 1, it says this, Now God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. That was the first day. He called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the, the evening and the morning were the first day. And if you go back and read this account after every creation, he began to tell the day and he ended it like this. 
and the evening and the morning were the second day, was the third day, was the fourth day, was the fifth day, was the sixth day. And what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. He rested. It was 24 hours each day that he created the entire world in 24-hour span every day. This is the God you're trying to micromanage for goodness sake. This is the one you're trying to say, well, it'd be better if we do it this way. And every now and then he'll let you do it your way just to show you what a wonderful way it was. Yeah. Yeah. 24 hours, 24 hours is all it was. Over and over and over, God created this in exactly the the, the same way. And everything God created was a reflection of the Creator. Do you understand that? No, you didn't get it. Everything God created is a reflection of the Creator. You've got to know that. You've got to grasp hold of that. You've got to get hold of that with everything within you. We are God's creation. If you read the creation of man, the Bible said, let us make man. God said, let us make man in our image. Who's he talking about? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's who he's talking about, the three in one, the Trinity. When he says, our, I'm making man in our image, and he created man, is his image. We are a reflection of the Creator. Are you getting any of this? It'll sink in about lunchtime probably. You know, you need to grasp what I'm telling you. We are a a reflection of the Creator. Very few of you ever knew my dad, but I am told, I didn't see it that much, but everybody else can see it, that I I could never deny him being my dad. They tell Brian he can't deny me being his dad, you know. I am a reflection of my creator. He is a reflection of his creator as far as father and sons. We have people here with children, and and I call them cookie-cutter children. I mean, goodness, the ever one look just alike. They're different, they're unique, but the ever one, there's no denying who they belong to, amen? They reflect their mom and dad, the creator, if you will. We are a reflection of the creation of who we are. We do that, and we do that with God. We are a reflection of God, and we're designed to be that way. It was the creation that God did in just six days of the entire world. And like I said, we want to micromanage him. Oh, my goodness. Why do we want to do that? Let me tell you a little bit more about creation, if you will, all right? The whole creation story where he created the, the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the, the, the animal, everything else. Do you know that we, us, were the only thing God created in his image? Three times in Genesis it says we are created in his image, a reflection of The creator. Man, that's a lot of pressure. We're the only thing he did. Do you realize that we are the only creation of God given the ability to create? When the animals can can, can, can build things. Birds can build a nest and things like that, but they can't create things. We have the ability, I don't, but some people do, to look at a, at a blank canvas and transform it to a beautiful picture. Other people have the ability to take a blank piece of paper, many of them, and turn them into a novel. They have the ability to create something on their own. This this building started out as an idea in somebody's head. And many times those creations, those paintings, those novels, whatever it might be, are a reflection of the Creator. But we are the only thing that God gave the ability to, to create things just like this. 
and so many other things in this world. Animals cannot do that, and we can only do that because we are made in the image of the Creator. We are reflecting, we are to be reflective of that image. Y'all like to watch a full moon. Don't you love to see a full moon? You know, we've had, we've had here just recently what they called super moons. When the moon was closer to the earth and, and a beautiful full moon on a clear night, man, it, 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 it lights it up like daylight, doesn't it, you know? And then it just starts fading away, you know, and, and, and then you have no moon and it's pitch black. But do you know that the moon has no glory of itself? has no light of its own power. Did you realize that? The moon has no light of its own. The moon is merely reflecting the light from the sun. And we, Christians, are a whole lot like the moon. Sometimes, man, we are shining like a full moon. And sometimes it's just a dark, dark night. There's no reflection. And why is that? Did the sun move? No, the moon did. Well, it, and I know you can break it down, you, you astrophysicists and you stargazers and all that other stuff. No, just let me tell my story. <laughs> Don't bore me with the details. Let me tell my story. Because it's true. Sometimes we are a half moon, half trying to reflect Jesus and half trying to live for the world. It just is. Sometimes we're having a really bad week and we're that little bit crescent, just a sliver, you know, just enough to get me back to church on Sunday and, you know, hope nobody knows about Monday through uh, Saturday. And then you get it put under the blood, and man, full moon's out. Woo! We are literally a reflection of the sun. Not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. It's up to us how much of a reflection that we are, because we are to be a reflection of the Creator, are we? How much of Jesus is people seeing when they look at us? How much of Jesus are people feeling? Preacher, they say, you know, during the full moon makes people crazy. So does living for Jesus. The world will think you've lost your mind, but you're right where you're supposed to be. You're right where you need to be. And it's, the sooner you get over worrying about what the world thinks and be more concerned about what Jesus thinks, the better off you're going to be. You know? You know the biggest thing I had to get over in my life? was me. I was my biggest obstacle, getting over what everybody thought and everything else. You know, I only care about what he thinks. That's what matters. That's what matters. We are a reflection. Now, now, in being that reflection and being the only, the only thing that God gave us the ability to, to the only thing made in his image, the ability to, to create the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, starts in a garden with the fall of man. The last book of the, of the Bible is the book of Revelations. And the book of Revelation is all about a new city, a new Jerusalem. We start in Genesis in a garden. We end in Revelations in a new Jerusalem, a new city. From a garden to a city, that's a lot of creation. That's a lot of creation. We're the only one, the only creation God gave with the ability to create. With the ability to create. Church, I want you to understand. I want you to understand that we are a reflection of Jesus. Good, bad, or otherwise. It's just like this right here. You've got one of these on the wall at home. And you look at it some days and you think, 
holy cow. I got to do something. And you look at it other days, and you think, well, that ain't too bad. And you look at it other days, you think, man, you're looking good today. You might not say it, but you think it. Yeah, you do. You need to. You know what? Same mirror. Exact same mirror in your house. You didn't get one of those magic mirrors that some of these people got to go to Walmart. And I love Walmart, by the way. I talk a lot about Walmart, but I love going and just sitting and watching. <laughs> but this is just a reflection. And even though this is my mirror, it reflects whoever looks in it. Whoever looks in it, it reflects. Because it only sees what's there. I, I can't make it make you look better. I can't make it make you look worse. I can't change anything in it. I, if, if I could, I'd do it for me, but I can't. Well, maybe I can. Maybe I can. Because I guarantee you, I don't look like I did when I rolled out of bed this morning. You don't either. So maybe I can make a few changes in me. Maybe you can make a few changes in you. Isn't it amazing the difference a hairbrush can make? Isn't it? Yeah, it is. Even with no more hair than I got, it's amazing. Isn't it amazing the things Jesus could do in our lives? If we let him, what we would begin to reflect, if it would just be a reflection of him and not me, because all the improvements you try to make won't get you to heaven. You've got to have Jesus. We are a reflection of Jesus. We are a reflection of the creator, for goodness sake. We are his creation. We are his greatest creation. We have, we have brought him more joy and more sorrow than any other thing he's ever created. He started all over one time with just Noah and his family. And I can't believe we can't be close to that point again. But folks, I'm telling you, it is time we begin to reflect Jesus more than anything else. I'm going to close with this last point, Greg. I told you Jesus took his disciples to the ungodliest place known to mankind at this point to begin to establish the church. Do you know why? Why would he do that? Why did he go to Jerusalem, the religious capital of the world at that time? Why did he do something like that? Why did he go to the devil's hometown to do that? Put the devil on notice. This is what I'm building my church on. The fact that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. The Christ who changes the world. The Christ who saves souls. The Christ who heals. The Christ who makes whole. I am that Christ. I am the son of the living God. And I want to put the devil on notice that greater is he that's, that's in this world that's in me than he that's in this world, folks. He's putting the enemy on notice that, that you're not winning. I'm going to build this church and the gates of hell. He said right there at the place, the ungodliest place on earth, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. You are not destined to defeat. You are determined to be on the winning side, church. You've got to be a reflection of Jesus and live that and know that. It is time you quit looking in the mirror and thinking, oh, man, this is bad. It is time you begin to see yourself as God sees you, as a saved, born-again child of God. You are not a loser. You are not on the losing side. You, if you know Jesus, you are walking as a child of Almighty God. We need to do it. We need to be a reflection. Do we walk boldly? Yes. Do we walk boastfully? No. We walk in love. 
and we share Jesus in love. And we let the world know there is a better way than the way they're trying to do it. What are we reflecting? What is the world? Because they're seeing something. They're seeing something. Stand with me this morning. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will see the goodness of God.
y'all can be seated for just a second, real quick. We're going to close out this morning's service uh, with a prayer. We got a young lady who wants us to to pray for. Her. She's going to have surgery very very soon, and we're going to do that. So Angie, if you want to come up, deacons, if you guys want to come up, and anybody wants to come pray with us, I want you to come up here. If you believe in what we're doing, we invite you to join us. And as they come, I want to tell you something. If you don't believe prayer changes lives, well, number one, I don't know where you've been for a long time, but we have a little girl in our congregation that this time a few years ago we were praying mightily for little Giovanna Hill. Four years ago today, she got a kidney transplant. They didn't know. But I'm telling you, she is one happy young lady today. That's what God does. That's what God does. When God's people come together and pray, you know, and, and, and I love it when anniversaries like that fall on a Sunday. I just think that's the neatest thing in the world. I, I, I truly do. And we're going to anoint Angie with oil. Angie is a, well, she's just an overachiever. The doctor told her that he'd never seen anybody do what she did. She doesn't need one surgery. She needs three, all because of one fall. <laughs> so, uh, but. It's just a small thing for the God I serve, for the creator of creation. Deacons, if you will join me, please. Anyone who wants to pray with us, come join us. Angie, if you and your family come over here with us, please. You know, this bottle I hold in my hand, there's nothing special, there's nothing magical. But the spirit of obedience is what makes all the difference in the world. And what we're doing is exactly what the scriptures say to do. You're doing exactly what the scriptures say to do. You're calling upon the elders of the church. You're calling upon your church family. To pray for you so because of your obedience because of our faithfulness and willingness to be obedient to the word we're going to pray this prayer and we're going to believe God's going to do exactly what God does on your behalf let's pray Heavenly Father we pray Lord, we pray because you've given us the privilege to be able to. We pray because you told us there's power in our prayers. We pray because we want to stay in obedience to you and to your word as Angie's called upon us to, to pray on her behalf. We pray for the doctors. We pray for the surgeons. We pray for every person in that room that's going to be involved in this, in this surgery. We pray, Lord God, a special blessing upon them for capabilities and wisdom and knowledge above anything they've ever felt before. We pray, Lord, that even during the, the procedures that things just feel so miraculous, that everything is so smooth, and, Lord, they can't deny your presence even in an operating room. We pray for Angie and her family. Lord God, that you would just bless them. God, that they would feel a comfort through this, that they would feel you through this, that they would feel and know, Lord, we know. We know that, that at the end of this, you're going to get the glory for it. So, Father, we're going to start praising you even right now, Lord, for what you're going to do in this situation and these set of circumstances. We just give this to you, knowing that on our own we can't. But, Father, when we unite in prayer, there's not a mountain that we can't move. There's not a valley that we can't fill. There is no obstacle that can stand in our way. You told us, Lord, 
You told us in your word even today, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the children of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we're so thrilled to be part of that church. We're so thrilled that it's not a building, it's a people, and we get to be part of that people. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for hearing this prayer. We thank you for the answer to this prayer. And we thank you, Father, for this family that you've chosen to make them part of our family and part they've always been part of your family. So, Father, we praise you and we glorify your name and thank you for hearing and answering prayer. And we pray it as you told us to pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. God bless you. Have a great day.